Hi, good morning um, or afternoon, depending on where you are. Um, I'm Bethany Goldblum. I'm the executive director of the Nuclear Science and Security Consortium, and you are attending the NSSC Alumni Speaker Series. So um, I'm just posting a link in the chat now. Um, this presentation that we have today is part of a series that brings back former NSSC fellows. So these um, were former students that were in the position that many of you are in today that have gone on to careers um, in nuclear security and nonproliferation, um, as well as other national security fields mm -hmm. at the national laboratories um, and other government agencies. So um, what's really neat about this is that you can see um, these are career options that you can actually pursue. Um, and then also this is a part of your community. So the speakers um, were previously in your shoes. These are people that you can reach out to um, for connections, um, for mentorship. Um, so it's a part of the broader NSSC umbrella. Um, so before um, I introduce our speaker for today, I just want to mention another um, NSSC co-sponsored um, opportunity that we have this Friday. So maybe, um, Austin, do you want to just say a few words? Sure thing. Thanks, Bethany. So this Friday at 12 p.m. noon Pacific, uh, the UC Berkeley Nuclear Policy Working Group and the ANS, American Nuclear Society, are going to co-host Dr. Matthew Kronig of Georgetown University, who is coming in to talk about his book on the logic of American nuclear strategy. And so the event is open to all. I will post the Zoom link in the chat here if uh, you want to copy that down. And yeah, I'm hoping to see you all there on uh, 12 p.m. Pacific on Friday. And if you want to learn more about the Nuclear Policy Working Group as well, you can visit our website at mpwg.berkeley.edu. So um, now I'm going to introduce our speaker for today. Um, Dr. David Weiss is a scientist at Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory, and he's in the Nuclear and Chemical Sciences Division, I think, in the Chemical and Isotopic Signatures Group. And so David was um, previously a graduate student at UC Berkeley um, working for Professor Stan Prusen, who was also my thesis advisor. Um, so we're um, academic siblings. Um, and it's really great. Um, I, nuclear forensics is a field that I've personally always been fascinated with. And so it's really great to be able to hear about this topic and also to see that this is a real career opportunity. So David, thanks so much for coming back um, to share your experience with the NSSC and um, welcome. Absolutely, yeah, thank you. Uh, so hello everybody. Uh, as you already heard, I'm David Weiss, uh, and today I'll talk about a few things, uh, spectroscopy, mass spectrometry, uh, and the, the grand journey that took me from NSSC PhD to your NSSC alum speaker today. Uh, so I guess we can, we can start there. Um, so who, who is this guy? Who, who am I? Um, well, if you put my name in Google and you scroll way down, you'll find this image of me. Uh, and it's the uh, professional photo I, I have taken of myself uh, once every decade. Uh, and my wife told me that I should update it, but still got four or five years left in it. Um, so, you know, stay tuned for that. Uh, but anyways, as, uh, as was already mentioned, I'm a staff scientist at, uh, at Livermore. Uh, more specifically in the Chemical and Isotopic Signatures Group, uh, which is part of the Nuclear and Chemical Science Division, uh, which is part of the Physical and Life Sciences Directorate. Uh, so I, I was at, at Berkeley as a student in 2012, back when Netflix was sending DVDs and envelopes and nobody was wearing, a, you know, masks of any kind. Um, and, uh, you know, I'm also a family 
man. We've got two human children and a cat, and uh, we just got a, a brand new puppy. Uh, so there's there's Leela, uh, and who's this dog? <laughs> she's uh, she's a German Shepherd puppy, um, and her title is Land Shark. And we didn't know this when we got her, but apparently German Shepherds uh, as puppies, all they like to do is chew on everything and everyone. Uh, anyways, that's uh, that's Leela, and she's our pandemic puppy. Um, but anyways, you probably maybe you don't really care about that, but uh, for, for those of you who aren't familiar with Lawrence Livermore National Lab, LLNL, uh, it is a national security lab uh, located in, of course, Livermore, California. And it is run and operated by the National Nuclear Security Administration. Uh, so, you know, it's, a, it's a, a big place. As mentioned, I'm in the Chemical and Isotopic Signatures Group again in the nuclear and chemical sciences division, again in the physical and life sciences directorate. Uh, so this is one of just a few directorates. So you can, you can imagine in such a big hier hierarchical structure with thousands and thousands of people, uh, there's lots to do and lots of work to go around. Uh, so this is, a, this is just a little chart of how the, the workforce breaks down here. And it's a, maybe a little old, but you get the idea. Lots of engineers and scientists, uh, pretty much any, any flavor of scientists you can think of. And a lot of us wear different kinds of scientists and engineer hats. So sometimes I put on an engineer hat. Uh, sometimes I put on a chemist hat. Uh, and sometimes I put on uh, you know, other, other hat. Um, Anyways, I'll, I'll put on my math hat now. So there's a little math column. Uh, this column actually doesn't add up to 100%. And I'm, I'm not sure why I didn't make this, but uh, you, you get the idea. Lots of different areas of, of work going on here. Uh, and there's lots of different kinds of national security mission areas that are served by all these different engineers and scientists of different technical backgrounds. So there's, um, of course, the, the weapons program, one of Livermore's main, uh, main programs is supporting the stockpile uh, and research and development in that area. Uh, there's uh, R&D for nonproliferation. Uh, so that's another big area. Uh, and of course, um, nuclear forensics, that's a big part of what my group does. Uh, and there's Actually, there's lots of other areas, uh, counterterrorism, uh, energy, uh, all kinds of mission areas. You can read about them on the website or, or you can ask me. Um, but there's also lots of basic research uh, that's conducted, not just you know mission-driven stuff, but basic R&D. Uh, and that's mostly supported, or at least in large part supported by what's called LDR, which is laboratory directed research and development program. So I guess the main point is uh, a lot of us do a mix of programmatic mission-driven type work uh, and basic research, and these things often go hand in hand. Um, okay, anyways. Uh, so how does one actually get from A to B? Uh, how did you get from college student uh, or PhD student to LLNL scientist? And, uh, obviously, there's a very rigid path. You get your bachelor's uh, at, at VCU. Uh, then you get a master's at, at Georgetown. And then you get a PhD in nuclear engineering uh, from Berkeley. And that's the only path. Uh, well, actually, that's, that's as you might know, not, not really the, the path for everyone. Uh, some, some people might actually choose to be a pharmacy tech at the VA for a while uh, and then get some additional training at TGI Fridays as a waiter, uh, very useful technical training, uh, and then go on to work at the patent office for a few years. Uh, I, don't, I don't think all of you need to take this path, uh, but that is one, uh, one of many different paths you can take. Um, but I guess what you guys care about the most is how to go from maybe your uh, graduate program or PhD program to, uh, to 
to deliver more scientists. Uh, so that's, that's probably the most useful part. Uh, anyways, uh, so I started at Berkeley um, as a PhD, young PhD student. I, I hadn't really landed on a, a specific advisor. I had, I had some inklings of what I wanted to do, uh, but it was really just by, by chance that I, I ended up in, in Stan Prusin's office, Professor Stan Prusin. Uh, and he didn't know me, uh, and I didn't really know him. Uh, but when I when I was talking to him, we we landed on our our mutual chemistry background. So Stan was a a very uh, you know very famous nuclear chemistry guy, uh, and he was extremely intelligent in that. Um, and when I when I was in that office, we we started talking about the fallout formation research that was going on at Livermore. And that sounded pretty interesting. Um, so I ended up driving out to, to Livermore, I think the, the following week. And that's where I met uh, Ian Hutchin, who was the group leader of the uh, chemical and isotopic signatures group at that time, doing a lot of research into nuclear forensics. So that's the, that's the nuclear forensics book there. Uh, that he wrote, he co-wrote with a couple other folks at the lab. Um, and I guess most of us have, have a copy of it. Um, and uh, of course, in, in that realm of thinking, there, there's the fallout formation research. Uh, and the more I worked with, with Ian's group, uh, the more I started meeting different scientists in that group who were all very passionate leading experts in their field, a uh, lot of analytical instruments, uh, just really fascinating stuff. So it didn't take very long before that's, that's what I figured that I wanted, wanted to do. Um, so anyways, my, my thesis work at, at Berkeley, I conducted mostly as a uh, kind of a, a student um, researcher at, at Livermore. Um, and we, at, at Livermore, uh, and we are, we were and still are interested in how the environment and conditions of a nuclear detonation go on to form uh, these little uh, bits of, of fallout, which we also call nuclear test debris. So fallout, you know, takes different forms and morphologies and all that, but, you know, oftentimes they look like these, these little glass beads, macroscopic glassy objects, we sometimes call them. Uh, but they, yeah, they look like little glass beads. And it turns out that you can learn quite a bit from these little, uh, these little things. Uh, so, you know, as mentioned, there was lots of analytical tools in, in Ian's group that uh, I was able to, to use and attempt to make my own interpretations of, um, of fallout formation processes and how things get mixed in together and preserved in, in nuclear test debris. And of course, uh, you know, the parameters of fallout formation. How, how long does it take to form these things? What temperature, what condensation processes, things like that. Uh, so um, I presented similar slides like this before, and uh, there is a, a spiel that I kind of developed uh, that kind of explains this thing. Um, in a near surface nuclear explosion, uh, there's a, a fireball that vaporizes the device and all the surrounding materials. And as that fireball expands and cools, uh, those molten uh, or those vaporized and molten bits of soil uh, start to condense and, and mix with the device material, and eventually it quenches to form fallout. Uh, and I think I even presented that during my, uh, my qualifying exam, and that was very carefully developed with Stan, uh, who he was pretty, pretty adamant about accuracy in the way you describe things. So I, I'm not sure if I actually said that the way we developed it, but um, that, was, that was a long time in the making. So I hope you enjoyed that. Um, anyways, these are uh, 
electron microscope images of uh, these little bits of fallout from a specific test. Uh, and that was a, a, a near surface test. So this is a secondary electron image, which just kind of shows you uh, surface features. Uh, here you can see this is like a bunch of little glassy molten bits that came together and uh, formed this thing that looks sort of like a cluster of grapes. And then this is a zoomed in backscatter image of this thing right here. So we, we polished it to, to the mid plane and you can see, you know, this, my cursor there, uh, this thing got stuck to the, the surface here uh, and that's, that's what that, that bit is there. And backscatter images are nice because they show you how the average atomic number changes across a sample surface. So, you know, things that are higher Z appear bright uh, and things that are uh, lower Z are, are darker. That's the, the two cent explanation of backscatter electron images. Uh, anyways, in, in these images, you kind of see these bright ring type interface features. Mm -hmm. We call them interfaces. Uh, so uh, they're all higher in Z. And I thought, well, maybe that high Z region might have some concentration of device material or structural material uh, that condensed onto the surface of these things before they, they got stuck together. Uh, so using uh, one of our famous mass spec tools, the nanoscale secondary ion mass spectrometer, or the nanosims, uh, we were able to get a spatially resolved look at isotope ratios uh, on a sample like this. We use this for all kinds of different samples, whether they be forensic samples or fallout samples or, uh, you know, Bio, biological samples. Um, it's a very uh, interesting tool that we have at our disposal here. Uh, and uh, lo and behold, at that interface, we found that there was an enrichment of uranium-235 uh, relative to you know, the rest of the, the fallout piece. Uh, so for, for the, the uninitiated, uranium-235 is uh, something that you might find from a device. So that, and a device is, you know, just a nuclear device that we tested. Um, so anyways, that is how I basically built my thesis around uh, these little, what we believe are condensation features uh, and then studying them and deriving things like uh, diffusion uh, and uh, time and temperature and, you know, how device material gets incorporated. And if you're really interested, you can read uh, my thesis here, which uh, it's only 250 pages long. So uh, excellent reading material, uh, especially right before bed. Um, all right, anyways, got the, the thesis knocked out. Uh, so how, I guess, how, how do you go from step A to step B? Do your thesis work at Livermore, and then uh, you know get a postdoc in the exact same group. That's that's how everyone does it. Uh, actually, that's that's how most people don't necessarily do it. There's there's lots of different avenues. So, uh, for example, we just hired uh, several postdocs who never did any work or research at a national lab before. Um, actually, I just happened to really like what I was doing. Was fortunate enough to you know apply and get a position in, in the group that that I was already. RDN. Anyways, uh, during my postdoc, I did quite a bit of work on fallout formation still because I really liked that, uh, but I expanded my area of study into high temperature uranium chemistry, which is uh, still directly related to fallout formation, just slightly uh, divergent path of study. Uh, but the reason why we care about, you know, uranium chemistry is, you know, I'm not going to get necessarily into the fine details here, but uh, uranium doesn't behave all about predictably in fallout formation and fireball condensation situations. 
uh, you know, we expect it to condense at high temperatures, but it doesn't necessarily always behave like that. So one thought was that, okay, maybe different oxides are forming and these different oxides, uranium oxides have uh, different condensation temperatures. So that was, that was one theory and we wanted to study that. Uh, so, you know, we can't, we can't do nuclear tests anymore and, and study that. So we have to, to think of other ways to study it. And uh, one of the things we like to do here at Livermore is use lasers to solve problems. So we, you know, we decided to, to try to solve the, the uranium chemistry problem with lasers. Uh, and I was thinking maybe I could solve some Lila's biting problems with, with lasers, but I don't know, it's probably frowned upon. Uh, anyways, if you uh, focus a, a, a pulsed laser on a uranium target or some target in a chamber, uh, you can, create a little plasma, high temperature plasma, you know, 10,000 plus degrees Kelvin. Uh, and then you can watch the chemistry using spectroscopy. So we have kind of a simple spectroscopy system, pulse laser comes in, hits the target, uh, target creates plasma, light from the plasma gets collected and we can either take nice images of it or we can send it into the spectrometer and, you know, get, get spectra, which we can directly relate uh, to, to chemistry. And, um, you know, one of the ways we did that was putting our target in a, a little chamber and, and ablating it, just, just like I mentioned. And, uh, you know, what's, what's nice about that is when you're ablating material in a chamber, stuff like uranium doesn't spray all over the lab, which, you know, that's also frowned upon. Uh, but it also lets you control the atmosphere around the target. So if you're trying to study oxides, uh, you know, being able to change the oxygen concentration in a chamber uh, can tell you, okay, under X condition, we're forming this kind of oxide and under Y condition, we're forming a different kind of oxide. And then we can try to relate that back to, you know, fireball, condensation and nuclear test debris formation conditions and try and get an understanding of, you know, why uranium is behaving in one, one way versus another way uh, and get a sense of how, how oxygen is, is acting in, in that capacity. Uh, so anyways, laser comes in, hits the target, creates a plasma. Uh, in that plasma, you have dissociated atoms and ions, uh, which they emit light because they're in an excited state. It's very hot. And when they emit light, it's at a, you know, very specific wavelength that we can use to, to determine what that plasma composition or vapor composition is. Uh, so, you know, uranium atoms are emitting at a specific wavelength and we can, you know, we can see a peak there at some wavelength attributed to uranium. Well, as that plasma expands and cools, just like that fireball, uh, it, it begins to react with the, the environment around it. And uranium will react with oxygen and it'll begin to form oxides. So UO, uranium monoxide, uh, emits at a very specific uh, set of wavelengths as well. And we can use our emission spectroscopy system and see, okay, there's the uranium monoxide and it's forming uh, at this ratio to uranium atoms in, in the plasma under you know different oxygen concentrations. Uh, so we were using that uh, to not only study you know how uranium oxidizes but uh, in the vapor phase, but we also would collect particulates and uh, conduct different kinds of analyses like, uh, mass spec or Raman spectroscopy to look for different phases under under these conditions, um, uh, under changing oxygen concentration conditions, and that just helps us understand, you know, how are these uh, oxygen concentrations in the fireball potentially uh, creating different uranium oxides that that might change the way we interpret the fallout? Uh, because if you don't know how the uranium necessarily got in there, uh, that's gonna mess up the way you 
make your ultimate interpretation of fallout formation conditions or or composition of the material itself. So, anyways, uh, I I tend to get hooked on things. So I I still really like spectroscopy, even after I finish my postdoc. Love spectroscopy, love emission spectroscopy, uh, and started figuring out different ways that it could get applied. So obviously, there's uh, my my favorite of favorites, fireball chemistry, uh, super interesting stuff, and uh, not done talking about that yet. Um, we'll get back to more fireball chemistry, uh, but spectroscopy can also be applied to things that the weapons program is interested in or different uh, global security programs that, that they might be interested in. Uh, and of course, back to that basic research where uh, you know, we can explore how novel materials uh, might be formed under these uh, really intense uh, you know, temperature conditions and rapid cooling conditions. And of course, this, uh, this image here is a personal favorite. I can't take credit for it. One of our, one of our students, uh, soon to be postdocs, took this photo. And this is just uh, a laser ablation of a uranium target. And you, know, you can see little uh, bits of uranium flying around in there, which you know, I think is pretty cool stuff. Uh, anyways, like I said, uh, can't, I can't really stop talking about nuclear test debris and, and fallout formation because I, I just really love it so much. Uh, and we'll probably find any excuse to keep studying it. Uh, and we're still studying it under two pretty, pretty big projects. So there's um, two different LDRD projects that, uh, that we're, are currently funding this work. Uh, and I had briefly mentioned that that's the basic research arm of, of the lab where you get to, to study things at a more fundamental level that don't necessarily have uh, direct programmatic applications. Um, so anyways, still studying fallout and uh, you know we're still trying to look at formation conditions and try to try to really get an understanding of how different test configurations, different environmental con configurations might uh, change the way these sorts of things look. Uh, and this is you know just another glassy piece of fallout that I painstakingly, polished or someone polished anyways. Uh, and then we did all kinds of spatially resolved analyses on them. So electron microscopy, um, uh, auto radiography, where we just look at the sample surface and try to look at how the activity changes across the sample that can help guide some of our analyses, uh, especially the nanosims, which can be really hard to you know, pinpoint specific areas of interest. You know, these are very large objects and a, a nanosims analysis spot might be only a few microns uh, in diameter. So using, using things like SEM and autoradiography can help set the stage or guide our more uh, sensitive mass spec tools uh, and help us look for things that we're really interested in like device related materials. Uh, however, even things like SEM can, can teach us a lot. So uh, as mentioned, these backscatter images uh, show variation in average atomic number. And you see a big bright streak like that in the sample and it, it always raises interest. Uh, so then if you zoom way, way in, uh, you can see that these, these little streaks are actually made up of tiny little uh, uh, crystals, crystallites, let's call them crystallites. Uh, and then if you use something like uh, energy dispersive x-ray spectroscopy, which is just a, a really nice feature of our SEM that lets us look for compositional variation of specific elements in a sample, we can see that those little crystallites are actually uh, predominantly iron-rich crystallites. And uh, you know, for those of us who've been looking at these kinds of materials for a long time, that's like really interesting stuff because you don't necessarily see that all the time, especially 
naturally occurring materials don't necessarily have things like that, uh, little iron bits. So that tells us, okay, maybe that has some anthropogenic contribution. Uh, maybe there is a big iron structure or lead structure, some structure that uh, contributed a bunch of metal into the into the fireball that dissolved into these materials. And then when they quenched, uh, as they were cooling off, they just started forming these little crystals. So anyways, that not only tells us about formation conditions, but that also helps guide our analyses. Uh, so if we're going to look for something, you know, that's present at a much lower concentration, uh, things like actinides, for example, uh, you know, that's, that's really helpful. So we try to associate uh, things that we see in a technique like SEM, which, uh, you know, is a, it's a little more user friendly. Um, we try to associate these features with things that you might expect to see uh, using a more sensitive technique like the nanosims, for example. Um, and then, you know, in these kinds of samples, we try to draw those correlations. So uh, if we see high concentrations of lead or iron, can we relate that back to something like uranium or other actinides? Uh, in my thesis, uh, we were able to see that iron was directly correlated to uh, uranium concentration. Uh, now, that's not always the case. As mentioned, these things behave in traumatically different ways, depending uh, on the test conditions. Uh, but you know, in this case, uh, this was from an article we recently published in the CWMD journal. We were able to draw a pretty distinct linear correlation in a set of samples between lead and plutonium concentration, um, and that that was pretty interesting. So th it's these kinds of correlations that we're looking for. Uh, there's a lot of heterogeneity in these materials. Um, so you don't always necessarily know what to look for until you actually sit down and uh, really look up close at these kinds of things. Uh, and just in these samples alone, we saw that there's, you know, 30 times more plutonium in one analysis spot versus another analysis spot. So you really do have to take a lot of care when, when looking at these materials. And that's not just uh, true of, of fallout. It's, you know, other kinds of samples that might come across, that we might come across in, in our group uh, or, you know, just different kinds of samples have different kinds of behaviors. And being able to, to really know how to, to look at them and apply different kinds of tools, that's one of the, I guess, one of the main challenges of, of my job and uh, other scientists in my group, what, what they do on the day to day. Uh, so I find it to be extremely interesting, rewarding work. Uh, I think that, you know, there's all kinds of different applications uh, of the different tools we have in our, in our group. And there's all kinds of opportunities for students to get involved uh, doing PhD research or, you know, just seeing what it's like to, to work at a lab. And uh, speaking of opportunities, there's, uh, you know, summer internships, uh, you know, typically in, in the summer, we host hundreds and hundreds of students at the lab. Uh, and our group has, you know, specific summer internship programs that I can let you guys know about. Uh, and, you know, when it's not, uh, you know, COVID times and, we don't have to take care to be uh, socially distant. Uh, we can bring students on site to, to see stuff. So hopefully we'll be able to do that once, uh, once all of that settles down. Um, but just know that that is a, a, pretty, a pretty straightforward uh, path to seeing what it's like to, to work at the lab uh, and in my group specifically. If you have interest in that, you can contact me about that or ask me questions. And I can either point you in a direction or put you in touch with someone uh, who might be able to satisfy a specific, uh, specific interest. Uh, there's also the graduate research program. So there's you know, funding support for students who might wanna do PhD research here or other kinds of 
uh, thesis research here. Uh, obviously, at the lab, we have university collaborations. Um, so there's you know large projects that we collaborate on, and uh, we, uh, as a team with students and postdocs and professors and lab scientists, uh, get to do some pretty exciting stuff. And of course, speaking of postdocs, there's always postdoc opportunities. Uh, we've hired, in, in my group, we've hired several postdocs even during uh, pandemic conditions. Um, so uh, not the most ideal way to come, come into the lab, but uh, there are still lots of opportunities for people who may be thinking about that in, in the nearer term. Uh, if you have questions about that, uh, you, can, you can let me know. So, you know, if there's any questions about the, the research that we do here, any opportunities uh, that, you know, ones that I mentioned or things that might come up that you have questions about. If you have questions, more questions about Leela, you can feel free to ask me about, about that. Uh, as you can tell, I'm always happy to talk about that uh, or fallout. Uh, and if you have any, any other questions, please, please don't hesitate to contact me. My email is weiss3, that's W-E-I-S-Z-3 at LLNL.gov. So uh, that's, that wraps it up. If you all have any questions, uh, you know, let me know. Great, thank you so much. Um, as far as questions, if anyone has questions, you can go ahead and just unmute yourself and ask the question. Or if you want, you can type it into this chat box. Oh, I guess I should be looking at the chat box. Let's see the chat box. Sorry, everyone. I'm I'm Zoom illiterate, so maybe if someone could read the chat. If there is a chat question. Sure, I can read any out. We don't have any currently, but I'll let you know. Okay. So maybe just to kick us off, um, David, if there are students in the audience here who are interested in, you know, working in this space or, you know, as an internship or even for their thesis topic, what would you say a, a first step? that they could take to to get going uh well that's um that's a good question i mean uh if if there are people who are interested uh in just learning more about it i think a summer internship is a pretty low uh risk way of doing that the the internship program here uh, as as you probably know is is really quite extensive and internships, they may only be for a couple of months. So, you know, if you don't wanna take a lot of time necessarily or commitment, you just wanna see what it's like to, to work at the lab. I think, I think that's a really good way to do it. And that's a really good way to, to do that for my group specifically. Uh, we have, we always have a lot of summer students in my group. Uh, in my research area specifically, uh, we try to host at least a couple of students every summer. Um, so I think that that is really the best the best way to get started. Um, or you know, if you have a specific type of work that you're interested in doing, like using a, a specific analytical tool or sample analysis you, that you think might be best suited to the kind of things that go on in, in my group, uh, you know, you can simply reach out to me or, or others in the group. We're always very open to, to direct contact from students. Um, and we can, we can either make it happen or figure out a path to making it happen. Did that answer the question? Sorry, I started rambling. No, oh, that was great, I think. And so if you guys do need a connection that you can reach out to Charlotte who can connect you with the um, right people at Livermore to start those conversations. And it looks like we have a few comments in the chat as well. 
So from uh, Jordan, what sort of equipment is needed um, for the ICCD to view the plasma directly as um, you showed in your figure, um, understanding that the pixels are easily damaged from too much light? Can I go back to my, ah, there it is. Okay, uh, so that's a, that's a very good point. Um, that's something that we've learned uh, from experience. We can damage that, we can damage the intensified CCD. <laughs> uh, so we have several intensified CCDs. And when I, when I started here, there was one uh, from, I, I guess at this point, it's, it's about 15 years old. Uh, and it's got all kinds of damage spots on it, specifically from uh, you know too much light on uh, the intensified CCD. So uh, typically in these kinds of experiments, we don't have too much of a problem. We may saturate the intensified CCD, uh, but it's not so bright that we screw things up. Oh, my lights went out. Uh, so you know. Basically, when the light when the light comes out of here, it actually has to go through the spectrometer, and that spectrometer has a grating in it that disperses the light onto the intensified CCD. And just by virtue of that alone, you're already eliminating a lot of the light that is coming from the plasma. And if we're really worried about it, we can start putting filters in the way, uh, ND filters. Um, things like that to limit the amount of light. But so far with these kinds of experiments, it hasn't been so bright that we worry too much about damaging anything in particular. Uh, but yeah, this is just a standard grading spectrometer. Uh, nothing, nothing super fancy. Uh, we buy ours from Andor and uh, you know, off the shelf stuff. Great, and we have two, um, I think, really fun comments. One from Ethan Boato, who um, is currently working at Livermore with a different group, and just said that he'd love to hear more about your spectroscopy techniques, um, interested in putting together spectroscopic imaging standards for uranium and plutonium. And then from Mark Straub, thank you so much for the talk. Um, not a question, but um, your publications were some of the coolest papers that he saw when putting together a review on nuclear forensics working with LANL. Mark, if you can, post a link to that a review paper in the chat because it's really great and it would be nice to share with everyone. And, and thanks to both of you guys for chiming in. Um, it's good to hear that people are engaged and excited. And here's a fun question from Peter Boone. He asked, did you have a favorite experience during your grad school, um, postdoc kind of research career? Uh, wow, great comments. Uh, <laughs> I, I often wonder if people are, are reading the papers because you don't really know until people cite them, uh, but I'm, I'm really happy that people are reading them and are interested. Uh, as for setting up imaging uh, systems, if you're at Livermore, uh, I'm happy to sit down and talk over WebEx or, you know, in, in person. If, if that's more useful, I can show you the labs, stuff like that. Uh, and I can talk about all that stuff offline. Uh, as for a favorite experience, that is, <laughs> that's a good question. Um, obviously, when you're a, a student, you know, you get to do all kinds of kind of new and exciting things and you're learning a lot and uh, you know there were uh, obviously specific classes that I, I really enjoyed um, I, I if I could go to school and be in school forever I, I would definitely do that and just go to classes all day so maybe those of you who are students don't don't want to hear that now but I guess in retrospect getting to do the uh, the coursework is actually really fun and interesting uh, but the hands-on stuff at the lab, I think that was probably my, my favorite part was actually getting to put hands on the equipment, run analyses, and then see things that maybe no one's ever seen before. Like that's really the coolest part is when you find something that you think may or may not be a new, uh, for lack of a better word, discovery, uh, that that's pretty exciting stuff. And when you get to see that 
in an image, uh, like on an SEM image, and you're wondering what something is, uh, and then you find out using a really sensitive technique that you know there's actually something important there, something really of value. Uh, that feeling of kind of discovering something new, that's, that was my favorite part of being a student. And that's actually my favorite thing about being a, a scientist at Livermore is when uh, that moment occurs, doesn't occur often, but when that does occur and you find something new, uh, that's, it's pretty amazing, a pretty amazing feeling. I, I don't think I'm alone at Livermore uh, when I say that, you know, that's, that's probably one of the, the favorite parts of most, most scientists. Um, so hopefully that answered your question, Peter Boone, uh, who is actually uh, a colleague of mine in my group. And uh, if you have more questions along those lines, Peter, you know where to reach me. Any other questions? We have some other kind comments in the chat, but from Ray Mariella, he just says, great presentation, well thought out scholarly approach to a challenging transient phenomenon. Um, so yeah, thanks on behalf of everyone. That was a really wonderful talk and thank you for kind of exploring your experience from student to what you're doing now. I think that was really great and helpful. If there's any other questions, anyone could unmute themselves now or type it in. And if there's no more questions, um, I'll send a follow-up email referencing all the opportunities we mentioned today. And I think you can get in contact if you have anything else you'd like to learn about. Yes, and please I do. Also just, I also wanna reiterate that this session has been part of a series. And so we're going to be having a few more. Um, if the next one I think is in April. And so you can tune in for that. Um, students that have gone on to a variety of different national laboratories. And then we're also videoing these. So we've had a few previously. You can check out those videos on the website. You can come back and watch the video from this session again, um, if you'd like. So um, yeah, please tune in for that as well. And thanks again, David. Thanks, thank you. Thank you very thank much. You. Thank you. Bye. Bye.